a beautiful little boy in Colorado left horrifically injured after what I believe to be a severe beating while in the care of a loving caregiver who I also believe was drunk. A baby boy, when you see Giovanni, your heart is just going to break. He's perfect. Have you ever seen a little baby and you think, oh, that could be the Gerber baby. That little baby's going to be a baby model. That's Giovanni. Just like a little angel from heaven. And when I think about this child being left in a coma by a nanny, oh yeah, fur is about to fly. I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us here at Crime Stories and on Sirius XM 111. You moms out there and you dads too, but frankly, this is to the moms listening because I fully believe, yes, there are a few sprinklings of dads that do this, but it's on us. We work. We take care of home. But most important, we take care of our children. It's on us to make sure they stay in one piece. They're healthy, they're safe, they're happy. Yes, you know what? I'm so blessed with a wonderful husband that's right there beside me, but in my mind, it's on me. If they live or die, it's on me. Can you imagine what Giovanni's mother has been through? Well, as a matter of fact, you don't have to imagine because joining me right now is Giovanni's mother, Stephanie Rickert. Miss Rickert, the moment I heard about Giovanni in a coma, we all started praying. I want you to speak to other moms and dads out there and tell them what happened. Let's just start at the beginning. How old is Giovanni now? Giovanni is two months, or sorry, two years, 11 months. He turns three um, December 15th. When you went about finding a nanny, how did you do it? So actually my kids were um, in a daycare that they loved prior, before this. Um, I actually ended up moving, so I had to find care closer to my home. And my friend, somebody that I've known for quite a few years, maybe four or five years, offered to watch the boys. Now, when you say boys, you have three and all. You've got Giovanni, two, and then you have, what, a five-year-old and a 12-year-old stepson. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yes, that's right. You have a handful. I have two, and I spend every moment that I'm not at work chasing them and trying to make their lives better, and I would not have it any other way. So I've actually seen this before where a mom asks a trusted friend, hey, do you know anybody? And the friend gives the mom someone and it all goes sideways. It's not the friend's fault. I'm sure the friend didn't know. So Actually, she was the friend that did all this. It was my friend who hurt my son. I thought that you actually got the referral from a friend. But are you telling me that you knew McKinley ahead of time? Yeah, I had known her about four or five years prior to her watching my children. Oh, my star, Stephanie, that makes it so much worse. So this is someone that you know and trusted. Now, tell me, You know, after COVID, a lot of people get to work from home. Were you working from home or do you have to leave the home to go to work? Oh, I leave the home to go to work. What do you do? Um, I was actually just a server at a restaurant. I'd been there for a year prior. Um, It's a Jewish deli. Um, And I just, the hours are only 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. But I would go probably six shifts a week, maybe. 
Okay, I'm sorry. What time to what time I want to write this down? You can um, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. So basically, the school hours for your other two boys. So you're exactly. home. Yeah, so you're home by 3.15, 3.30 when they get home. Exactly. And so you bring in this who you believe to be a friend to take care of Giovanni. Mm-hmm. Stephanie, do you say Rickert or Reichert? Reichert. Uh, Stephanie, what happened that day that Giovanni was hurt? Um, so actually, I had received a text message um, from McKinley asking to have Giovanni overnight um, free of charge. It wasn't unusual because um, she would take my kids camping and stuff with her family. Um, so I agreed to it. Around 8 o'clock p.m., um, we got a phone call from the hospital um, stating that our son was dropped off with blunt force trauma. Okay, well, wait, wait, wait. So, and I, I've had babysitters stay with me overnight or stay with the children overnight mm -hmm. many times uh, when I would have yep. to go out of town, and, and I did not like having to go away at all. But I trusted them. Question to you. When she asked, could Giovanni stay over? They didn't go camping, or did they? They ended up not going. He was dropped off before. So the first you know that anything is wrong is a call from the hospital, not from her? Yes, yeah, she actually texted me after the hospital called. She didn't call me. And what did she say in the text? Um, that we needed to rush to San Anthony's hospital because Giovanni went lifeless after a bath. Okay, right there, right there. Guys, with me is Giovanni, two-year-old Giovanni's mother. Giovanni horrifically injured after a beating, a beating from a nanny who we now believe was drunk. To Special guest joining us in addition to Giovanni's mother, Stephanie, who was speaking out today for all you moms and dads listening. With me, Dr. Jan Gorniak, renowned pathologist, former medical examiner in Clark County. That's Vegas. And you know, Dr. Gorniak never had a lack of business in Vegas. Dr. Gorniak, <clears throat> a child... And I, I know this is crazy, but very often I would bathe the twins three times a day. In the morning when they woke up so they would feel fresh. Then like in the after lunch um, and then before they went to bed. But we used it as a time to like read books and play music and all that. But that said, a baby doesn't just go lifeless after a bath. That doesn't happen. No, it does not. So it's interesting, and Stephanie, my 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 prayers go out to you too and speedy recovery for Geo. Um, but yes, when and it's interesting because I'm not going to say a good number, but a, quite a few of my child abuse cases that I've worked on, it's in the bathtub. The bathtub comes up, and I believe that the perpetrator um, puts the kid in the bathtub to try to revive them. So it's not like they went unresponsive when they were in the tub. I believe they were already unresponsive and they were just trying to like, you know, want to splash water on them or something. So that's, that's really a, interesting. That's always a red flag. for Dr. Them. Gorniak. That's really interesting because thinking back and anybody on the panel, we have a lot of awesome guests today to support Stephanie Reichert. And Stephanie, do you call Giovanni Gio? Yes, we do. I, now that I'm thinking about what Dr. Gorniak has said, she's right. I'm thinking back on so many abuse cases, and so many of them start or involve the bathtub. And one of the very first cases I can think of along those lines is a name that will forever live in infamy, Louise Woodward, the au pair. Baby Maddie Epen died after a bath. Take a listen to our cut nine. 
Louise Woodward is a British teenager when she joins an au pair agency and begins working for physicians Deborah and Sunil Epen. She is to take care of three-year-old Brendan and eight-month-old Matthew. In her third month on the job, she calls 911 claiming Matthew stopped breathing. At the hospital, doctors realize his injuries were so serious, police are called in. Matthew Epen has a fractured skull, a subdural hematoma, and an ophthalmologist notices retinal hemorrhages suggesting shaken baby syndrome. Woodward is arrested, charged with assault and battery. When Matthew Epen dies, charges are upgraded to murder. Woodward never talks to police, deferring to the au pair agency supervisor. At trial, the jury finds her guilty of second-degree murder, and she is sentenced to life in prison. However, at a post-conviction relief hearing, Judge Zobel reduces the conviction to involuntary manslaughter, and she is sentenced to time served and released. Oh, as I recall, his name is Judge Hillard Zobel, and I will never forget it because a jury convicts the au pair, Louise Woodward, of uh, murder too. And everybody got hung up on the shaken baby syndrome. I don't know how they managed to forget about the fractured skull and the subdural hematoma. But that said, at sentencing, the judge says, yeah, I know they convicted her of murder too, but I'm just going to let her walk free on time served. That actually happened. And we're seeing here that baby Geo has a horrible, horrible blow to the head. And Woodward told the jury, she took the stand, that she, that, that somehow baby Maddie squirted out, jumped out of her arms after the bath and cracked his skull on the tile floor. To back to Geo's mother, Stephanie Reichert. Stephanie, what exactly were Geo's injuries? Um, he had a sub, I don't know, a subdural hematoma. Yes. Um, he had a nine millimeter um, midline shift in his brain. He had uh, <clears throat> bruising all over his body, on his neck, his arms. He had the bleeding behind his eyes. You said the name. I don't remember the medical terms. Um, bleeding behind both of his eyes. He had a huge bite mark on his forearm. He had a slap mark on his thigh, a slap mark on his back, and just bruising all over everywhere. Stephanie, it's, it's just so much worse than a blow to the head. Um, you know... Let me go to uh, Christopher Byers, private investigator, former police chief, Johns Creek, now owner of ByersInvestigative.com. Listen, <laughs> you and I, we're not MDs like Dr. Gorniak, but I know when a baby or person has bruises on their arms like this, that baby was held by the arms, slap marks, on his back, and it's like a bite mark. Look, Stephanie Reichert isn't making this up. These injuries are in doctor's reports. Doctors that don't care. I don't mean they don't care about the patient. They do care about the patient. But they are writing clinically, analytically. They're not making up a, a dramatic scenario. Like if I want to know the truth, I look at what the medical examiner writes. Because they don't care. They don't care who you are, where you're from, what color you are. They care about your anatomy and what cold, hard science tells them. Same thing with doctors. I don't know why they're that way. They're very, um, let me just say, antiseptic when they write out these reports, Chris Byers. So when a doctor who doesn't know Stephanie Riker, doesn't know Geo, is not a relative or a family friend, they write down, there's bruises on the neck and the arms. There's a slap mark on the thigh. There's a slap mark on the back. There's a nine millimeter shift in his brain. He has a blow to the head. There's blood behind both of his eyes. You better believe it's true, Chris Byers, and this is more than just dropping the baby on the tile floor of the bathroom. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is no question whatsoever that this baby was abused. Um, it is just so sad to hear. Listen, again, my heart and prayers go out to 
Stephanie and her family and little Gio. But uh, yeah, there is no doubt this is abuse. I am looking at a picture of Gio lying in the hospital. And I remember I nearly vomited when I saw the twins um, in the NICU. I saw them right when I gave birth and they took them out of me. But when I saw them again, they had tubes, intravenous, you name it, all over them. They were so premature. And I'm looking at baby Gio. He looks like he's got black eyes. He has uh, a bruise under one eye. He has just been through hell, hell. To Stephanie Reichert, Gio's mom, hours later after that information, you find out your son is fighting for his life with blunt force trauma injuries to his head and his body. And tell me, Stephanie, what happens when you see Gio? So when we arrived at the hospital, we weren't allowed to see him at first. He was in scans. Um, actually, the chaplain, they said that they were getting the chaplain for us, so we thought he was um, dead. Um, after about 20 minutes of waiting in the waiting room, we were allowed to go back and see him, and he was unrecognizable. Um, I'll never forget uh, seeing him. Um, they had, He had 50 doctors standing around him. We couldn't even get close to him. We couldn't touch him. And he was on, I mean, he was not, he wasn't breathing when he was dropped off. So it was just awful. When we, because we dropped him off to the daycare or her house. And when, when we dropped him off there, he was fine. And then when we seen him, he just didn't look the same anymore. He was so beat up. When you say he was so beat up, what did you observe? Um, his eyes were all, this was before surgery, but his eyes were bruised. He had the tube down his throat. He was on a ventilator. I mean, it's so hard to, you know, remember everything because it was awful. Like, I, I'll never be able to explain the feelings of seeing him like that. I understand that when you went in there, Stephanie, and you saw him and there were 50 doctors, literally 50 doctors, you thought, crowded all around him. You actually had to leave the room because it was so exactly. overwhelming. It was just so overwhelming, all the machines beeping, everything they were saying. And my boyfriend was um, standing right by my side. And all I remember him saying was, why does he look like that? My baby, why does he look like that? Joining me right now, Dr. Angela Arnold, who is a renowned psychiatrist in the Atlanta jurisdiction. You can find her at AngelaArnoldMD.com. Dr. Angie, yes. that moment, there are certain moments in life, like if, if you asked me, what did you do yesterday? I'd have to reconstruct my day. Like what mm -hmm. happened? It was like a whirlwind. But there are moments in life that are indelibly etched in your mind, you can't get rid of them. I remember as a girl when my dad had his first open heart surgery, they had to airlift him to the University of Alabama heart wing. He was so bad off, even Emory and their renowned, world renowned heart wing wouldn't take him. They didn't think they could do anything wow. for him. I remember when I walked in and it was this big open area and my dad was there hooked up to all sorts of things. And at a distance, I saw it was him, Angie, at the door. Mm. I dropped to my knees and started yeah. praying. When I saw the twins hooked up to all of those machines, it was unlike anything I had ever seen before. There are some moments, like what Stephanie's describing, you never forget and you never get over. It was so bad she had to leave the room. Well, it's a tr it's such a trauma. It's a trauma and you are completely, you have absolutely no control over what's going on. So, and, and Nancy, I'm sure that every guest that you have listening today can't even imagine 
and we can't even imagine what that child looked like after he was practically beaten to death because let's call it what it was what it is he was practically beaten to death by someone who that mother entrusted to his care this this is horrific Baby. And yeah, she will be she will be traumatized by this and she will see visions of this in her head and i'm not quite sure how she's going to be able to ever trust anyone to be around her children Gio had to be airlifted to the hospital. He needed an emergency operation. He had a bleed on the brain, which required part of his skull to be removed. He was intubated, which means they take a big, thick, uh, like a hose, and put down your mouth and another um, tube inside that so you can breathe. He was in a coma and has had multiple life-saving operations since then. And when you say it looked nothing like him, Stephanie, my little nephew, he was like my baby to me because I didn't have children for so long. He was hit by a car and I was still practicing at the DA's office prosecuting and I got a call that he was in intensive care, a race to intensive care. And when I saw him, Stephanie, he didn't look anything like he did normally. His head was swollen up like a pumpkin, and he had a shunt, which is another kind of tube, going down the top of his skull. I nearly, I felt like I was going to pass out. Didn't look anything like him at all. Just so you know, Stephanie, as encouragement, he went on to get a double major in biology and IT, and now he's a, sh a hot shot IT troubleshooter at a big company. So he he went on, he went on, and he had to go through rehab. Uh, he, he, he it was in Scottish Rite Children's Hospital for a long time, but now you would never know anything like that had happened to him. Praise the Lord. So Stephanie Reichert with me, Gio's mom, you go in, you see him. It's so overwhelming. You have to leave. When did it dawn on you? Well, hold on. Dr. Gorniak, what does this mean? A nine millimeter shift in his brain? What is that? Well, she described, um, and also you said the doctor said that he had a subdural hematoma. So what that means is, well, you have your skull and then you have a layer called the dura mater that overlies your brain. So you have blood that's underneath that, so between the brain and the dura. So the, the blood has nowhere to go. So it's not like you cut your leg and the blood can bleed out. So what happens in the, in the head is the brain has nowhere to go. So when the, I mean, the blood has nowhere to go. So when the blood is accumulating, it's pushing the brain to one side. So it was almost a centimeter pushed to, to one side. So there's pressure on the brain. And for people that don't know, what is a centimeter? One centimeter is how much in an inch? <laughs> I don't know. I, I know you have to do that. So I think it's two, two and a half centimeters equals an inch. Right. So it, 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 you know, so it, it's a less, less than an inch. Less than half an inch. Correct. But, I mean, when so, you... Three, three. What, what, Jack? Point. Three, nine, three. Okay, I'm going to go with a little le yeah, less than half like, of an yeah. inch. Um, but yeah. when you're talking <laughs> yeah, about pushes, movement of your the brain. brain, the blood right. is taking up space in the skull, and the brain has nowhere to go. And when the brain moves and it starts touching the skull, that means Correct. the brain it's is going to start swelling, Absolutely. and it has Absolutely. nowhere to go. I learned all this because of my nephew. So that is why they actually, in my nephew's case, cut a hole in his skull to relieve pressure so the brain would have Correct. somewhere to go. Is that why right. they removed like, part of Geo's skull, Dr. Gordiak? Absolutely, because of, of the swelling. So not only just because of the, the, the blood, but because of the injury, there's more injury to the brain and it swells. And you're absolutely correct. It has nowhere to go. So if it keeps pushing against the skull, 
I mean, at some point it's going to cause a cardiorespiratory arrest. So they remove part of the skull just to give it some room to, to expand without but being... But just because your brain swells does not mean you're going to have permanent brain damage. Right? No, it does not. Because it does the swelling not. can, they can get go back early, down. Early enough. And by Correct. these procedures, Stephanie Reichert's telling us about removing part of the skull. Did he have a shunt in his skull, Stephanie? So that was the last surgery that we just had two days ago. Um, they placed a shunt because he was having issues with the fluid around his head. It was collecting in the pocket in his, in his frontal lobe. <sighs> Stephanie. So had yes, and that's, a, that's a, yes, and that's a, another procedure they can do to, you know, you don't want that. It's called cerebral spinal fluid. You don't want that fluid to collect because, once again, there's not enough space, especially in a little skull and a little head, for anything to collect. So you want to Correct. remove some of that so the so the brain can heal. Yeah, and he had a lumbar drain, which is a drain that was in his spine um, for a week, and it just wasn't. When they took it out, they knew that he would have issues with the fluid, so they went ahead and put the shunt in. Where is Geo right now? He's in the living room here with us. I'm in a different room, so because he's pretty loud. <laughs> that makes me want to cry that he actually is home. To, you know, Brian Foley uh, joining us, board certified criminal defense attorney, former chief prosecutor, Harris County, Texas, author of What Prosecutors Don't Tell You. And you can find him at brianfoleylaw.com. Brian, I tell you what, I would get a hold of this nanny and I would not let go of her until I had chewed out a piece of her rear end and spit it on the council table. I'm telling you, this woman needs to be prosecuted for attempted murder. Yeah, and as a prosecutor, if you're in Colorado, you can get hamstrung a little bit because it sounds like they've only charged him with a class three felony for causing you know, a serious injury. And that's only four to 16 years in prison. Whereas if it's an attempted murder, um, then that's a significantly higher punishment range in Colorado. So it, it's going to be on the prosecutors for sure to do the investigation and, and make sure that they have evidence that can help hold her feet to the fire because the, the pictures that we saw are tragic. I, I agree when, when Stephanie talked about it didn't look like the same child, you know, the before, the night before, and then afterwards. Yeah, are you looking at the now, picture of him sitting on the sofa holding a a tan-colored stuffy like a, a teddy bear? Because right, and then the picture. completely different. I would not have even thought it was the same person, Brian Foley. And, and what's going to help prosecutors, I think, in this case to prove that this is obviously no accident is that bite mark. A bite mark is an intentional act. It, there's no accidental bite marks left on a child, especially when you consider they also have black eyes and the uh, subdural hematoma. This is a brutal attack, which um, is definitely going to, to need to be prosecuted to a large extent. Got a question. Stephanie Reichert is with me, Giovanni's mother. To this day, Right now, as we're speaking, McKinley, Stone Hernandez, McKinley Sloan Hernandez has not revealed, won't say what really happened. Yes, that is correct. All she admitted to is that she was drinking and he whipped her in her chair. That's all she'll say? Yep. She won't say anything. Even after being arrested, she won't say anything. You know, um, I'm trying to figure out why this has happened, how drunk she was. But frankly speaking, Dr. Angela Arnold, being drunk, why would that make you beat up a baby to the point that the baby's in a coma? Right. And, you know, Nancy, that's not even an excuse. This is, this is such a horrific act of rage and violence to a, 
helpless child. I don't care. And if she was that drunk, then why wasn't she passed out on a couch somewhere? But she wasn't drunk enough. If the, if that was, if there's any truth to that, to know what she to not know what she was doing. Yeah, because she actually did. She drive Giovanni to the ER, Stephanie. Um, yes, we actually heard um, from the hospital that she drove him to the hospital while her boyfriend was trying to revive him. And are mm. you telling me, Stephanie, that at one point we know Giovanni was not breathing? Yeah, he wasn't. When he was dropped off at the hospital, he was unresponsive and his heart rate was in his 50s. So almost cardiac arrest. Joining me right now is Anastasia Germain president of Child Care Professional Services, LLC, founder and former operator of a child care center, and you can find her at childcareps.com. Anastasia, thank you for being with us. What is your number one piece of advice to families searching for a babysitter or a nanny? To ask a lot of questions and do as much research as you possibly can. A good place for parents to start is at childcare.gov. And there is a link there for each state where parents can go use a pull down menu and find a plethora of resources for all types of childcare options. Parents should be doing their best to look listen and ask questions. Look around the facility for safety and cleanliness. A lot of parents choose family and friends for their first child care options. Still look, listen, and ask questions. Look for simple baby proofing, electrical outlets, are all of the things within the home, the toys, the playground areas, are they in good repair? Are there emergency procedures in place? Even if it's a family home care, is are, do they have procedures in place? Is the caregiver CPR trained? Um, do they have, do they provide well-balanced meals, snacks? Uh, what is their discipline policy? Does it agree with yours? Um, is there a stimulating environment and a routine in place? All types of things that you can look for and ask questions about. Um, also, in the case of home care specifically, you know, in licensed child care centers or licensed facilities, any guests coming into the house have to sign in and out. That's not the case in a home care, especially in an unlicensed facility or a friends and family or a nannying type situation. So you want to talk to the caregiver about guests and the flow of traffic coming and going. Um, yeah, I want to know center. who's coming in and out of the daycare. And again, there's nothing at all wrong with a friend or family as your daycare. I was raised all day by my grandmother and my nephews were raised by a family friend instead of going to a you know state run daycare. And I think to Nicole Parton joining me, CrimeOnline.com investigative reporter, this woman, uh, McKinley Sloan Hernandez, it's my understanding that she had an unlicensed child care facility at her home. That's right. She did. And she actually listed herself on several resource pages online. Um, one that I saw was on the Lakewood County Child Care Connection, where moms could go online and look for a nanny, look for daycare. And she had, you know, an ad there. There's a few openings left for child care. You can trust your child here, loving environment, safe home. Um, so other people were paying her and trusting her to care for their child as well. Child care is a $60 billion industry in the United States. And she was trying to get her fair share, I suppose, but without providing the service. And when I say unlicensed child care facility, I'm not saying it like it's a dirty word because trust me, my grandmother, my mama, Lucy, who I named my daughter after, um, she wasn't a licensed child care facility. She's my grandmother and she took care of us and fed us and we would play outdoors. It was a farm. Um, 
And it was a, a wonderful childhood. So having a family friend or family, a relative with your child while you're at work, that happens all over the world. And that is what Stephanie Reichert did. Stephanie, I mean, to, in your mind, McKinley Sloan Hernandez was running a, a home care for children, right? Yeah, so um, she watched my kids for a year. When she first started watching them, it was just their babysitter. She wasn't watching any other kids at that time. And then just recently she started, she had posted on all those pages on Facebook saying she was an in-home daycare. And then she started watching other kids and she would have quite a few kids over at her house. What do you mean by quite a few kids? I mean, one time we went there, we decided not to drop Gio off because she had 10 other kids there and she was the only one. And she was, they were probably, half of them were under the age of two. That's too many for one person to be handling. So, yeah. Stephanie, have you ever confronted her and said, what happened? Um, no, actually, after she had texted me to go to the hospital, that's the last I ever heard from her. She never once checked on him to see how he was doing, to see how we were doing. She just she um, blocked me on social media, actually, and that was the last I heard from her. What are prosecutors telling you, Stephanie? Um, so I don't even know how to answer that question. We have court again, we have the first court dates on the 20th of December. Um, but basically what they're saying from what they had, their evidence they have, which we haven't seen yet. Um, she is the abuser. Did she, uh, have a boyfriend, McKinley Sloan Hernandez? Does she have a boyfriend? She did. Um, it is his house. Actually, he owns the house and she lives there with him. Was he home when Giovanni was beaten? Um, I don't know for sure. Um, as far as we know, they're leaning towards that he has nothing to do with it. Now they have um, issued a warrant for his whole ring doorbell camera. And I'm sure we'll find out more after we're able to see those videos. See the evidence. Yes. Yes. So, Brian Foley, what I would be doing right now, if I was the prosecutor, I'd get that boyfriend and squeeze him like an orange to yeah, find out what, if anything, he knows. And remember, this is just boyfriend, girlfriend. There's no marital privilege invoked here. So she can't say, oh, he can't testify against me because we're married. He can testify to every single thing she has said or done since this incident. I'll tell you he what I want to do. He has do. an attorney. Well, well, I want to measure what, that Stephanie? bite mark. What, Stephanie? I said... Um, he actually did. He has an attorney, and he's been pretty um, cooperative with everything they've asked, and he's provided stuff, evidence. So, Question. Stephanie Riker, Giovanni's mom, is the boyfriend still with McKinley so Sloan Hernandez? Are they still a couple? Actually, no. He moved out of the house the day this all happened, and he moved in with his mother. Dr. Angie Arnold, say no more. That tells me everything I need to know. He's going to testify against her. I'm mm -hmm. telling you right now. And he better. Because if he she better. has any history, if any other child in her care has come home with bruises or lethargy, he's in it. Because if he had any idea this was happening and it's his home... Basically, the daycare is happening in his home. He's on the hook. He better cough up oh, pronto. Nancy, how can you beat a child? How can someone be beating a child in one room and someone's in another room and can't hear what's going on? So that's a great question. Stephanie Reichert, did the boyfriend have a job? Yes, he actually did work. He's an electrician or he's an electrician in training and he goes to night school as well. Wow. Okay. Well, I know for sure he does those things. You know, Chris Byers, if these two were married, the state would have a problem. But since they are just dating, he can testify to everything he knows. Absolutely. He is going to definitely be the, the state's key witness because, gosh, it's so frustrating on investigations like this when, you know, you've got a victim that can't tell you what happened. Uh, so, yes, he is going to be a huge key witness in this to 
Stephanie Reichert, number one, do not let anybody talk you into a cheap plea. Don't let her off with a five-year sentence. She'll do two years and be out. Don't do Oh, it. no, there's no way we're going to let that happen. And absolutely not. In I fact, feel like I, she should be charged with attempted murder. I do, too. Because this is, oh, I just him. dropped him. She almost killed your baby. So what does Giovanni's dad have to say about all this? He's right here. Would you like to talk to him? I would love to. Hello. Hi, is this Giovanni's dad? This is. Thank you for being with us. What's your take on all of this? Man, uh, you know, it was just something that came from left field. You know, it's, we didn't expect it ever in a million years. You never think that somebody who you're trusting is going to put your child in harm. Like the whole point of him going with her was because we trusted her and we thought that he was safe in her care, that she really cared about him. Can I ask you, Anthony, why? And I'm not saying you shouldn't have at all. But what about her? made you trust her because other parents trusted her as well. It's not just you, but what about her was so trusting? Uh, I, I wouldn't go far, I'd go so far saying that what about her was trusting. I, I don't want to start because me personally, it, she wasn't exactly like my friend friend. This was Stephanie's friend, which we, we happened to meet because she happened to be dating one of my friends years ago. And that's kind of how we all met. So like I knew of her, but me being the dad, you know, I don't, I didn't really associate with her too much. It was her friend. So they were always mostly in communication. That's why the night when this happened, she only texted Stephanie. She didn't, I never got a text. We, neither one of us got a call from her. The, the hospital actually called my phone um, when it happened. And what again did the text say, Anthony? So the text that Stephanie got was, you know, you guys need to rush to St. Anthony's because Giovanni went lifeless after the bath. Went lifeless, my rear end. You know, uh, Anthony, you, you understand Stephanie, as a mom, is going to be so distraught. You have got to be strong for her and with her, and do not let anybody talk you into a cheap plea. This woman, this is attempted murder because this wasn't just dropping him or one blow. Your baby, Gio, was beaten, beaten over and over and ended up in a coma because of what she did drunk, according to prosecutors. You know, that night when we got to the hospital, because we rushed to the hospital extremely fast when we got there you know both of us were our brains weren't working at the moment and when we first walked in um they finally when we were asking you know were giovanni's parents they finally said hold on let me get the chaplain for you was the first thing that i was told now i'm prior military so you know when they came out and they said let me get the chaplain i immediately first thing that went through my head was my son was dead um then they tried to take us into a little waiting room. And when we went to the waiting room, McKinley and her boyfriend were in that room. So they took us away from there and they, they actually like kicked us out of there and made us go stand somewhere else in the hospital until they came out. So when the chaplain finally came out and we were able to talk to her, um, the first thing I asked was, was my son was alive? And she said, yes, he's alive. You know, I think they were doing imaging at the moment, which is why they brought the chaplain out right away. But it's just the whole chain of events you know, did not help. Um, so like Stephanie was saying, we finally got to go back to that room and, you know, it was a room no bigger than, you know, maybe 10 by 10, if that, and, you know, bed in the middle, he was strapped to it and a zillion doctors around him. And Stephanie was sitting out. So she had to walk out. She had a little, you know, barf bag, you know, she's hyperventilating. And I just kept asking, you know, what happened to my son? Why does he look like this? Why does he look like this? And then uh, I just remember the Flight for Life guy saying, you know, we're going to get your son to because they had to Flight for Life in the Children's Hospital in Aurora. They just kept telling me, we're going to get him there safe. We're going to get him there safe. It was a guy with like, he looked like something out of Top Gun. And then another guy with really long hair and they were awesome. Um, 
And when we were walking out of the hospital after they were like, we're going to take him now to, to Children's Hospital, as we were walking out, the only thing that she ever said to us as we were walking out, she looked at us both. The both of them were standing outside. And she goes, did they tell you anything? And all I responded was their flight for life and in the children's hospital. And that was the end of the conversation. She didn't say anything else after that. And we went to children's and now have not heard from her once. I do know that that night, um, you know, they, the, the, the officers had like taken them into custody and took their phones. And that's when they started asking them a bunch of questions. But I do know that not once were they, did they instruct her to n- not reach out for anything, you know? And like, I understand accidents can happen. And in a situation where it was an accident, if it were me, I would be reaching out a thousand times over. I wouldn't have left. I would have been by the side, you know, the entire time. The fact that she dropped him off and then just left, you know, I, I, I just don't see how anyone could even believe that she didn't have anything to, you know, well, and like, let, it just let me understand something, Anthony with me is G- Giovanni's dad, Anthony Stefano. Have you heard from her boyfriend? No, but so again, there's, I guess there's a bunch of evidence that we as the parents have not seen because it's been this long going on investigation. Um, when we did talk to the detective, he did mention that uh, the boyfriend, his name's Dan had been, you know, was really curious about how Giovanni was. And at that time, the last time we talked to the detective, we said it was okay if that they gave him our contact information if he wanted to reach out. But again, haven't heard from either one of them. But we do know those two have split up, right? Correct. That's for our understanding. The last thing you want to do is have a lifelong commitment with somebody that gets drunk and beats a child. No. I mean, you know, a lot of people get drunk. And they pass out or they think they're funny and they tell jokes or they get sad, they start crying or they drive and have a wreck. But to get drunk and then beat a child, this isn't just dropping a child, guys, or he wouldn't have bite marks, slap marks, all that. I mean, Dr. Gorniak, this is not a simple fall based on what the medical doctors put in his record. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, and it's just interesting. I was at a, I attended a presentation um, on Monday and was just talking about simple falls in children. So a simple fall would not no way. cause that much damage. I'm always I mean, amazed, you, you, Dr. Gordiak, when somebody says, oh, the baby fell out of the stroller and died. It, that does right, not no. happen. To, right. So a simple fall, if she was holding him, if, like you were talking about the other case, they slipped out of the bathtub. I mean, just look at, think of the playgrounds at parks. You know what I mean? I know how many times I fell off you yes. know I mean? the swing set die. or the jungle gym. You know what I mean? Exactly. So with all the injuries, it's not a simple, it's not a simple fall. I mean, th- these sound like injuries he would have sustained in a car crash, like your, your nephew. Anthony, That's question to you. What is the prognosis? What is Giovanni's future? Has he had brain damage, number one? So what we were told, luckily we were able to see a couple of the images from the last time we were in the hospital, and they said that he didn't have any or didn't show any type of brain damage, luckily. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His brain healed perfectly. So um, before we went back this last time to have the bone flap replaced in his head, um, he was when we left, when they let us, sorry, let me back up. When they let us out, he had to leave. He had to wear a helmet all the time yeah. because he was missing the bone flap, right? So if you didn't know Giovanni and other than the helmet, you'd look at him and it seemed like, you know, nothing happened to him. You would believe that there was nothing wrong with him at all. Nothing happened. He, he talks, he actually talks a little bit more than what before this incident happened. You know, the, there's there's slight differences like the irritability. It's very difficult to divert him now uh, when he gets upset, you know? Um, But, and he's not as like, he was always such a sweet loving boy and he still is, but it's, it's only with me and his mother and like nobody and his brothers, obviously, but nobody else. It's just, you know, he, he can't be away from us for more than, two minutes. I, that's why this has been difficult. We're passing the phone back and forth. You know, one of us has to be with them all the time. Cause he just, it, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know, to be honest with you. He's just, 
you know not what? exactly the same, but he's still a happy little boy. What is your message to parents looking for a babysitter? Yeah, you know, we have a bunch of boys, so they jump on the trampoline, they play, they're rough, they come back with bruises and bumps all the time. I never thought that she was doing anything, but now I realize there's, there was times where Gio said she pushed me or something like that. And she'd say, oh, he fell and he hit his head on this and he'd come home with a bruise and we didn't think much of it, kind of just kind of played it off. Like, oh, you're fine, you're good boys. Now I will say that if your kids ever, ever mention anything that you think is far-fetched, whether it's a babysitter, family member, anything of them hurting him, always look into it. Because I feel like if I had looked into it sooner, I felt like I could have prevented this, kind of. Please do not torture yourself. I have crime victims' families forever. I even do it myself as a crime victim. Torture myself about what could I have done differently to save my fiancé, to just, I do it all the time. And there, you did everything right. And very quickly, Anastasia the, the, Germain, uh, President of Child Care Professional Services. What was the website you just gave us again? Childcare.gov? Yeah, so if you go to childcare.gov, no matter what state you're in, there's a pull-down menu where you can find your state and find the resources. In Colorado, it's the Colorado Department of Early Childhood, and specifically their quality initiative is Colorado Shines. And what's interesting um, and helpful for parents on that site is not only do they include all of the resources, but they also include a list of child care sites, illegal child care sites that were right. sent a cease and desist letter so parents can go on there and look. As we go into the Christmas season, our prayers with little Giovanni Reichert with his mother and his father for healing and peace and also for justice. May it rain down like lightning. Goodbye, friend. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.